being led to believe means that we are up and running. We are now streaming live on Facebook. Yeah. Uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us here today. I'm going to quickly introduce myself and our filmmakers, our guests today. We'll show the trailer. We'll get right into the discussion. Uh, hello. Thank you guys for joining me. My name is Danny Farber. I am a business development executive for Mandy's Casting and Operations, as well as an actor and a filmmaker myself. Today, I'm joined by Kelly O'Sullivan and Alex Thompson. Kelly wrote and stars in the film, playing the flailing 34-year-old nanny named Bridget. Alex directed the picture and acts as one of its producers as well. Guys, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having Thanks us. Thanks for having us, yeah. Well, before we get too into it, I would love to kind of show the trailer of your film, St. Francis, for our audience that hasn't had the chance to see it yet. So without further ado, in technical difficulties, be darned, I'm going to share my screen and... Here we go. Hey, I think you might be on your period. There's a little bit of blood. A lot of blood. The milk is I'll, get, I'll take care of pillows if you want. I know that some guys are into this. They call themselves bloodhounds. Oh, I'm not. Bloodhounds. Yeah. It's really hard to take anything seriously with this much blood on I swear to you, I'm not a bloodhound. So you'd start in June um, when Granny gets off for school, and uh, in August we'd set you free again. Have you nanny before? Not full time yet. I've babysitted. Sat. Granny, you have a very important call. Okay, here's Francis. Word. I'm for sure getting rid of it. Okay. Your sperm ran probably super fast. It's a compliment. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. When you were a baby and you screamed and screamed and there was nothing I could do to get you to stop, I'd imagine taking you by the ankles and swinging your little arm into the wall over and over until it was a bloody pulp. Oh my God. I don't know what you should tell that story. I'm throwing not the milk, the olive star old. I'm tired of my mind getting heavy with the mold. I need to start a garden. 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 I, a I apologize. Gonna start a I'm smart! I'm smart! I'm brave! I'm brave! I'm the coolest! I'm the coolest! I'm the coolest! Ladies and gentlemen, there you have it, the trailer for St. Francis. Guys, even seeing that again just makes me uh, very emotional. Uh, I really, really enjoyed that film. We uh, got emotional when it said in theaters February 28th, and we were like, yeah. if only we knew what was going to happen yeah, two yeah. weeks after. Oh, February. yeah. So that's, so that's funny. I, um, I got a chance to see it. I was one of the only people to see it in screens, I guess. Is that me? Am I playing with it? Oh, I think that so. I think it, you, it YouTube. Oh, uh, it does it twice, and we're there. Okay, there it is. A little technical difficulties, which uh, yeah, I kind of call that. Right 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 there, um, I got to see this in uh, Los Angeles though at the ArcLight Cinemas. Um, one of the only screenings to do so. Um, now, I I would love to kind of talk about the film, but you know, given the fact that uh, this is going to be broadcast to people who haven't had the chance to see it yet, I would like to kind of keep keep this conversation more uh, broadly on the aspects of filmmaking as a whole, if that's okay with you guys as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we did make that. Being said, um, I'd love to hear some inspiration you guys have, you know, from how you began writing this film. I began writing it um, sort of based on two pieces of my real life, um, one of which is that I was a nanny, and the other of which is that I did have an abortion. And so then I used those two pieces of reality to sort of spin into fiction. And I started writing that in January of 2018 and we were shooting by July, which now I think about that and I'm just like, 
the glory days, <laughs> like yeah. having an idea and being able to make it so fast. Yeah. 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 I wonder what, what is that, what's that experience like taking an idea from conception and then into pre-production and then out to festivals in under a year? I mean, that's pretty unheard of. Like how did you guys manage that, that timeline? It was, it was kind of about just like pulling resources together and pulling and like group mind in a way. Like we, there are, there are maybe like four producers, four or five producers that are just like always, every, anybody listening probably knows that a producer has a lot of different definitions. And so this like group of people are just like the brain trust of a lot of stuff that we do. And that's like Ian Kaiser, Raphael Nash, uh, Pierce Cravens, James, and James Choi. James Choi and our DP, Nate Hertzellers. And so it was really like, okay, we're gonna put a bunch of zeros on our line item budget, like locations and stuff like that. And then we're just gonna make a spreadsheet and be the insane people who track down every one of these things. Um, so are you actively producing and, and prepping while writing the script while it's going through revisions or how does what that work? What was that? Yes, in this case. Yeah, um, I had finished a first draft three months after I had started. So I just, I recently looked back and we did our first table read in April. Yeah. And then once we did that, we were sort of like, do we just go? Do we just start trying to make this happen? And we did. Yeah. <laughs> and then it was a miracle that we actually ended up on set day yeah yeah I feel like a lot of times um especially like, like filmmakers earlier in their career they get caught in this phase of pre-production uh development and then you just kind of go back and forth between like development get into pre-production and then back into development and kind of go back and forth I mean what are you know some obvious pitfalls that we can kind of avoid as filmmakers ourselves moving forward that you know advice you might have for the audience to get out of that well I've done I've done it all I've started production with not enough money in the bank and known it. I've started production with too little money in the bank and not known it until halfway through. And then I've started production with a certain amount in the bank, thinking it was enough and then had the resources to sort of, to, to make up for it in an honest and yeah. open way. Um, so I think the biggest thing is that you just need to have a plan A and a plan B and, and actually stick to it. So like, we knew uh, our first thing was, okay, we're going to have X number of dollars in the bank before we shoot. And we're going to have Francis cast. And the script was just so good from the get go. We just knew like, those are the things that we, we don't have control over. So let's work to get those locked down. Um, okay. So you take, you take larger elements of the production that, um, you know, are going to make the film what it is. And then you kind of work outside from there. If that's like your pinpoint, then you kind of take larger steps away from that. Because if you've got to break down a script no matter what, right? Mm -hmm. You know that by the time you get to shooting, you're going to have, you know, if the script says that she takes off her sneakers, you're going to have sneakers. But, and those sneakers, it's very easy to get like the best ones possible. But the person wearing the sneakers is the other element in the breakdown that might be harder, that might take more time. So like yeah. knowing that there's a momentum to it, starting with those big pieces and making some sort of um, landmarks, I guess. Mm -hmm. And prioritizing, like we didn't have a wardrobe designer. We didn't have any hair and makeup yeah. because we thought, well, people can wear their own clothes, knowing that this is like a small budget film. Sure. Um, and we wanted people to look real. So it was about prioritizing which pieces to get in place and then which pieces to go without. Yeah, and rather than rather than apologizing for those details, it was it became a part of the identity and the ask of the thing. Hey, do you want to like this project? You can, don't you have can hear that. You can see that in the DNA of the film itself within these characters, within the people, the spaces they occupy as well. These are all um, lived in, in spaces and the wardrobe is, is not brand new right off the rack, right? So that kind of adds a little bit more towards your, your character development. Was that, you know, do you recommend doing that if you are kind of tighter on a budget or is that something that like, You'd rather have, like in hindsight, would it have been more helpful to have a wardrobe designer uh, per se to go ahead and take those responsibilities? Yeah. The number one thing is just, we needed a script supervisor. Yeah, it wasn't. We didn't yeah. have a script supervisor and there would be days, I mean, it shows up in the movie where it's like, I didn't bring that item of clothing. 
because I didn't think we were going to be shooting that this day. And so I didn't actually mind not having a work, even though I think those positions are incredibly valuable. I didn't mind not having them, but there was like a script supervisor. I was like, we're going to get one of those. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, yeah. I think you can't really buy like realness. And so anything that can get you closer to something that feels real. Like I always think it's funny when young filmmakers spend a whole lot of money on like an immaculate empty apartment. And they're like, yeah, like I'll put some good things up on the wall. And it's like, it's gonna look empty and soulless. Why not just shoot someplace someone actually lives and find the right spot for what you need? Um, Sure. Yeah. Now, uh, Alex, you know, as this story was developing, um, you very quickly attached all those producers that you had mentioned um, to try and get this movie made immediately, like right out of the gate, right? Um, can you give any advice um, outside of what we've already kind of talked about in terms of finding that team, the, the, the people around you to believe in this story that, that um, Kelly's written for us? Yeah, I mean, go go with your gut, not with the people that you think you should be partnering with. It's like, I I say cool as a um, derogative term, like don't look for the cool person who makes you feel bad, um, who's got a cool rig. Like everybody who signed on to St. Francis, they were folks who have stuck with me through really good projects and like less successful ones. And at the end of the day, I think they were all involved because they love the story and they love the people involved. Um, it's not because like, you know, Ian is the, the, I don't know, like, um, the Steven Spielberg of producers, you know, he's just like a wonderful guy who, who shows up and like gives warmth and has great opinions and ideas and is curious. And works so hard. And works so hard. Like doesn't have a superiority, you know, he's on the ground level the entire time with us. Yeah. I've always heard that it's, it's more about finding who you want to spend 12 hours a day with rather than the person who's perfect at their job. Yeah, I think that's true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> though I would say Ian is perfect at many people's jobs. Uh, sure. Yeah, well, that's a good producer, you know, you gotta wear a couple of yeah, hats. Yeah, but I think you're right. right. Yeah. Kelly, I know that you have a, a pretty extensive uh, uh, theater history uh, background in Chicago. Do you have, when writing the script, did you kind of have people in mind for some of these roles? How important do you think it is to kind of follow up with past cast members? Huge. I mean, I wrote several of the roles for people that I knew, people who I had talent crushes on or who I had done shows with. And it really helped me in terms of specificity. And then talking about speed, it really helped in terms of being like, we don't have to go through an arduous casting process. I can just like email my friends Lily and Charine and be like, will will you guys be in this movie? Um, And And that's such an exciting email to get there. I'm sure everybody's like, yeah, I'd love to be in a movie. That sounds awesome. Yeah, and, yeah. and there's that built-in trust. I think the film feels like an ensemble because we all knew each other. Um, and some of yeah. that is from the Chicago theater community and some of that is just like I, the ethos here and being part of readings really early on. So it was incredibly important to me to have, you know, this rich city to be able to reach into and say, do you want to come work on this thing? I like that idea too of of reaching out to your talent crushes, as as you put it. Somebody who you really admire, you want to work with them, and it's almost like you've created a, an opportunity just to be able to to work with them, just to hang out with them on set, kind of thing. Oh yeah, yeah. that's the way I want to do it from now on. Now I'm just like thinking of all the actors I've ever loved and been like, they'll say no, but I can I can write a part for them and then see what happens. Bradley Cooper, what are you doing? Come on, man. <laughs> yeah. next I do um, think. That- Oh, no, go oh, ahead. Sorry. No, continue. Oh, sorry about that. I was just going to say, I do think like the first projects that I worked on in Chicago as a producer, I, we worked with PR casting and we would do these really big casting sessions where like every single person in the city would come in for every single role. And you really got to see hun- like hundreds in some cases of actors. And it was amazing. And for this project, it felt like all that past knowledge of like, who you like, what they can do. It, it was, we only auditioned two roles in the whole film. I mean, including like Man at Lake or Library. Yeah. Like those were what, were what were those two roles? Francis. And, um, and then we, yeah, 
So. Who we found through PR casting and they were incredible and we wouldn't have known her, known about her without them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we love AJ at PR casting. So shout out AJ. Oh, amazing. Amazing. But I mean, let's talk, that actress, her, her name is Ramona, right? Plays Francis. Yeah, yeah. What a little scene stealer. She is incredible. What, what's it like to work with such a young performer and, and how did you guys find her? Yeah, we just had, I mean, AJ set up casting sessions with a bunch of little girls ranging from ages like six to eight primarily, or maybe a little bit older. And Ramona came in and she was five when we met her, but AJ and Mickey and Jennifer were like, we have a feeling about this yeah. person. Yeah. yeah. She had been in like some improvised commercials and that's it, no, nothing narrative. And, but no, a, scripted, no material. scripted material. In this script, she was in 60 pages of dialogue. Yeah. So what, what is that for you guys as the filmmakers who are all responsible for this child on set to kind of create this environment for her that's going to be easy to work in and also not um, overwhelming to the fact that she can still perform at like the highest ability? How would you go ahead and do that? Well, she is six, so <laughs> she creates her own environment. A lot of the time, <laughs> truly. I mean, I really think a lot of it was us like catching up to her. Um, and because she's six, she adapted so quickly. Like a film set at its best is all about structure, you know? Um, you know, pictures up, you know, on your marks, you know, ready, set, go. Sure. And she took to that. She really took to that. Um, and it became about like finding ways not to improvise the lines, but to improvise like the moments before and the, the mood of the scene and, and how to get her in that headspace. Mm -hmm. So it was really easy, I mean. But we learned as we went. At first we were being too like loose and playful, like not having any discipline on set. And her parents were like, we have rules for her at home. Can you guys please try to like be disciplined on set? And we right. were like, all right. Yeah. Because sure. before that we were just like, whatever you want, Ramona. Well, especially when, when a, a crew with, with the sounds like it's so close together it always kind of feels like summer camp right yeah. and then you have an, a child there and it really feels like summer camp as well so yeah. you kind of need that structure and i, I want to mention you know for people that um may not be able to afford uh professional casting directors go through casting agencies there's a wonderful online platform uh it's called mandy.com in which you can find your actors especially mandy kids to find your child actors as well now um i think two things that filmmakers struggle with most when they're starting out is funding and distribution. Do you guys have any piece of advice that you can give our audience, especially when the content of the script might be slightly controversial in terms of going about those two aspects? Well, the, the biggest thing with funding is that you will, every aspect of filmmaking can seem sort of like a black box. You're like, like I remember starting out and being like, all right, I need a casting director because I don't know, I just need one and they're expensive. And I need a gaffer because I don't know. And they're just a, they're a person. And I think what you start to realize the more you work and the more you read about it is that everybody has a different process for filmmaking. You know, Kelly Reichert's films are made in a specific way. They all cost about a million dollars. And like, and, and she, she has a specific aesthetic in mind as well. What I would say for funding is reach out to the people that you know and like put it out in the world that you're that you have a project but i would be ready with a budget i would be ready with sort of the dream like this is a film that can be made for 50 grand this is a film that can be made for 100 grand this is a film that can be made for 20 grand because i have this 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 resource i'm going with my friend who has a camera you know we're offsetting the budget in these 16 ways seeing that all in a list is really exciting to somebody because what it says to them is, I'm gonna put 20 grand into a film, but the film is gonna look like it was 100 because, oh, I have a friend at a color studio and this would normally cost this and now it's costing this. I think oftentimes I find we breeze over these in-kind services because we assume movies are supposed to cost money. But in fact, acknowledging those relationships, acknowledging those in-kind things, it actually ends up making your project feel more responsible and attractive. I think. Mm -hmm. And we talked to Iris Sachs about funders and he said, you know, don't promise them that they'll get paid back. Just promise them a ride. 
Yeah. And I was like, that's a great way to think about how to approach invest investors. Because I think if you're going in with an independent film and being like, you'll get this money back in a year. Oh, you're breaking the lock if you do that. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. I mean, you're, you're, I put a, a, a page on every pitch deck that says, this is what it means to invest in a film. And it's pretty much the same in the independent world since for forever. These limited partnerships, you know, it's 50-50 production equity, 120% ROI to equity before 50-50 uh, waterfall splits. And just having it written out like that simply, I find that people more often than not send it to their lawyers or somebody and then sure. they go, yeah, okay. Well, it's, it's being transparent with it, right? It's, it's letting everybody know exactly the, I love the ride that you're about to take. This is a journey we're going to make together because, you know, it has to come from a place of belief in the story and you guys as filmmakers and also to have that foresight of, of where you want to take this project. I think that's really yeah. smart. That's great. And then our, our investors, you know, all of them visited set at least once, maybe a couple of times and then came to South by Southwest. And, you know, we couldn't have promised them that part of the ride, but we were like, let's be an open door in terms of you get to watch how this film is made. Um, sure. And I think that's exciting for people. Yeah. Now, did the distribution come at South by or where, where did that fall in line? So this is another thing like you, you said, Danny, know where your film is going or like know what know how it's gonna progress. I think something that Kelly and I talk about a lot that maybe sounds like um, fairy dust, but it's like you, you, you have to know the dream because that's the thing that you know better than anybody. Like before, before we shot St. Francis, we sent a pitch deck to Oscilloscope. And okay. we were like, hey, I think this is gonna be really great for you all. Do you wanna invest in it before we even shoot it? And they were like, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, but if we have it, it'd be great to see. Yeah, but, but we basically have like a series of emails that are like, South by Southwest would be a great premiere. Like that makes more sense than Sundance or Can. Like this is a scrappy film. It's got some like um, social issues that are relevant and would probably not be commercial enough for Sundance. And so, it, we kind of had our sights set on that stuff. Um, Where did that research, I guess, how, how do you go about obtaining that research? And then what part of the process are you putting that attention towards um, the, the making of the film? That's a good question. Um, what, I, what I tend to do, I began to obsess over like, well, what are the movies I like that feel like they're of their contemporaries to what I'm doing or, or just ahead of me? And where are they ending up? You know, who are they ending up with? Is it IFC? Is it Magnolia? Is it this? Is it why are they doing that? Is it because they're a part of the lab? Is it because they have a star in the in the lead? Literally, I made a a, a really crazy grid of all the films that were at South by in their discoveries category. What their poster ended up being, where they were distributed, how much money they made. Was it a success? Was it not a success? And what I found every time was that you end up where you're supposed to. Your, your like dark and moody European drama ends up at Kino. It doesn't end up at Magnolia. It, sure. it just doesn't, or it ends up at music box films. But like there, are, you, you kind of are gonna end up where you're supposed to. You may self-distribute. That might be the best thing for your movie. Um, so would you say that um, in order to kind of have a successful festival run, you want to kind of you want to go into your film knowing where where it's going to be shown, who who the audience built into it is. Do your research on the festivals around you, and then kind of start manufacturing an experience you know that will most likely guarantee you into their their fest. I think you. I think what it is is in the craziest way possible. It's about knowing yourself. Mm -hmm. So know yourself. Know your film. Know the dream. And then you get to define the success. Mm. Like if, you, if, you, if our success was, we're gonna make a big international sale at Cannes, we're gonna premiere at Sundance, win an award and get like distribution that makes all our money back, um, we've failed. <laughs> <laughs> if it's like getting a small MG and a domestic release that like ended up getting upset and then kind of like back on its feet and we got into like South by and did all right, then I think that then we succeeded. But I, I do think that there is like, there are a lot of different ways to define success and there's so many different kinds of films. Um, 
the, the best version of your film has a home. And it's not about finding the home and then fitting the film to the home. It's about like, know what that best version is. Mm -hmm. Because if you try to reverse engineer it and you're like, I wanna go after Magnolia, so I'm gonna write a movie for them, then I think it'll come off as being inauthentic. And um, sure. something that we've like really discovered is authenticity rings true and people kind of admire when you're when you kind of just make the thing that feels right. And then they're like, okay, now we want you in our house now because you seem like you know yourself. Yeah. Did you guys come into the festival circuit with your next project already lined up? Cause I know a lot of times you got to strike while the iron's hot, right? So what, what do you do if you've- We you didn't know, strike. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, well then even so, I think that that's a good lesson though, you know, just to kind of explore where you, it takes, 150 percent of your soul and energy to make something and then people are looking at you right when you're just kind of on your on your debrief from the experience you know what's what's a good piece of advice that even if you can give yourself to to kind of have those things in hand on when you're having these deals with distributors and production companies yeah well i do think that's sort of a that is a somewhat separate those two things are somewhat separate worlds we found. Okay. Where the, the distributors, I think, when you get distribution or when you have distributors interested in you, they're so focused on that year's slate that unless they have a production arm, they're probably not gonna be, they're not the person you need to pitch your your next you know summer comedy with a six-year-old in, in it. Uh, but, when you start talking to production companies and agents, I think it really helps to not just have one script, but to have multiple ideas. Mm -hmm. I think what we found is it actually doesn't take a written script to get your, um, to get your hooks in like somebody creatively, to get someone excited about you. You've already made a movie. They're already excited about you creatively. And that one script that is your baby, that might not, it might not be for them. The, this go around. But if you say, I have this book that I want to investigate the rights for, I have this TV show idea, I have this limited series, th the more diverse that is, the better. I don't know if you yeah. agree with that. I would also just say, like, give myself the piece of advice that sometimes I will meet people in production companies and my instinct will go, we're not necessarily spiritually aligned as artists but I've been wrong so many times. Like there have been times that I've left meetings and been like, well, that guy was a total frat bro who doesn't get like the feminist movies I wanna make. And then that guy will email and like read the next script that I've written and he will be more responsive than and excited else. than anybody else. And just like our investors are mostly old white guys. And I cannot believe that they were like, sign me up for this movie about, you know, women's lives. And so I would just give myself the piece of advice that, that you're gonna find compatriots in places you don't initially expect. And so not to write anybody off. Um, yeah. Because it paid off not to for me. No, that's great. I think uh, don't trust your gut is always good advice. I know, and it's so weird. It's, yeah, yeah. in some circumstances, it's like trust action. And the people who are taking actions to, to help you, that's the thing to trust. Yeah. Uh, I got our first uh, fan question here from Joyce Gray Carter. Um, do you know any good organizations to approach for funding grants? And how many festivals did you guys submit to? Wow, that's a good question. Uh, grants, I, I have found that there are a ton of great grants that are um, city, city by city, some of the major cities like or, or states like Illinois has some great grants, the Illinois Arts and D DKs. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I know that there are some, man, it is so hard right now because I'm in, when I think grants, I think like COVID relief. Sure. Um, yeah, that's, I'm sure they're taking a lot of the grants right now. I have, I don't think either of us have really, well, Kelly has been. I got a grant for theater. Mm -hmm. um, and that was through the Princess Grace Foundation. And I wonder if they do something. I know they do something for filmmakers. I'm not sure about funding productions. Um, but yeah, we haven't gone the grant route Roo Rooftop. Yet. Rooftop Films has some great grants. Um, okay, great. So Rooftop in New York and, and for shorts and features. Um, and they're wonderful. Um, yeah, I wish I had in more. Case, 
No, it's a totally cool. In case Joyce is um, international, I'd say, you know, just a great way to go about that research is I think taking it uh, regionally, locally, you know, see what's in your city and just do hot searches on, on Google keyword searches of your city production grants funding, and then finding like films within the story you're trying to tell and then seeing what worked for them. I think that is a really good approach. Yeah. yeah. And one, one thing I'll say is I never, ever regret applying for a grant. And I always, when a grant recipient is announced, recipient is announced for a grant I never thought I'd get. And then I see the recipient and I'm like, oh man, I bet I could have got, like, I never ever regret doing it. And yeah. even the grants that say like, oh, we, we don't have money, but we have in-kind services. You may think you've got your camera package figured out, but like, wouldn't it be nice just to have that? And, and you never know what that company, what else they're going to offer. They might have insurance. They might have um, other resources. So I, I think, I, I think if I could tell myself advice in the past, it would be to have applied for more grants. And I think a lot of times with grant applications, uh, you can kind of look at them like, like a, a, an audition, right? Where, you know, we're especially right now with self tapes, we're sending out self tapes all the time to people that you'll never hear back from. Maybe you will, maybe you won't, but it's, getting your face out there and, and A, taking a chance on yourself, but B, you don't know if, you know, down the line, somebody's going to recognize your work from a self-tape and ask you to audition for another thing. Same with these grants. You don't know even if you don't get accepted for this grant, they might put you in touch with somebody else who's also offering similar services. That's Sometimes, true. you know, grant operators just don't have enough, um, enough, they have connections to other people in, in that world without the resources themselves. Yeah, and it's yeah. a chance to investigate your vision more thoroughly. Like I putting together artist statements for like screenwriting labs that I apply to. When I actually have to sit down and write 500 words and make them meaningful words, not just rambling, I often find out more about the script than I would have. And it makes me refine the way that I think about the whole story. Yeah. Alex, do you rec or um, Kelly, do you recommend um, writing for yourself again? Would you do that again? Like writing to star in, in your pictures? Not for a few years. No, no, no. That was, I mean, I had a great experience, but what I'm learning is there, it gave me so much more agency to be a writer that now I'm like the agency that would come with directing is even more. And, you know, I think it's, it's a, it's an, uh, an evolution that I think for a while, I'm going to try to just be on the filmmaking side and then slowly maybe um, try to write for myself one day again, but maybe just like a two line part. Okay, something a little smaller, a little less involved. Pop in, yeah. pop out. But if you're yes. amazing, do it. You know, like if you're yes. amazing, like Kelly is amazing, <laughs> then then why not? That's a resource that you have at your disposal. It's like... Totally. I mean, Phoebe Waller-Bridge, Michaela Cole, people who are just killing it in all aspects, writing for themselves, acting. Yeah. I think there's no reason not to. I just know the next thing that I've written, we're going to co-direct. And I can't imagine doing all three things and not losing my mind <laughs> oh, yeah. plus i mean it's one less person to have to pay you know you can just put yourself in as the biggest role for the most amount of days on set and you know you're good that is what happened yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 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 um can you guys speak a little bit about what it's like to work with your significant other on on an offset yeah yeah did you see my is smile it, it, for a second yeah yeah is that good do you recommend it when you do it again clearly you guys are trying to <laughs> correct something during together. this question we were trying to like put rosy colored glasses on it because it worked out very well yeah but i will say it's hard it's like a major challenge to spend all day with each other on set and then come home and it's still the same person except now you're like lying in bed together and you're thinking about like locations the next day yeah. we made a we i would highly recommend doing this and following it we made like a list of boundaries that was like we will not talk about the movie in bed we will not talk about it in these in these places and, and we didn't follow those rules um one thing i would recommend if you are directing your significant other just do playback don't you don't think you have time, do it, do playback. Because that was my biggest, that put me in an existential funk for like the whole shoot. I would get through the day and, um, and I was like, oh my God, we got it. I can't believe we got it. Kelly, I'd be like, all right, see you, Good, goodbye. And Kelly would go home and I'm just, yeah, all right. There goes first team uh, and then I'd wrap up and then I'd come home and the first thing that I would hear was, I don't think we got it. Oh, God. And because we didn't have time for playback. And so sure. it, it was, um, 
it was just crazy. And then I would just have to build myself back up for the next day where I was like, well, we didn't get it yesterday, but we'll get it today. Um, it's also different having written a personal story. Like Alex and I had worked together before where he was a director and I was an actor. And that was, that felt so much easier because I didn't feel responsible for the story being told. I felt like I have this one very clear job and I know that he is the captain of the ship and, and that's okay. It, it was the shared ownership and personal nature of the story that I think really compounded it. But, but it's like everything, you know, you'll have good days, even when you're just an actor with a director who's never worked with before, you'll have good days with them. And then days when you may not feel as aligned. And the only difference is then you can't come home to your significant other and complain about the asshole director. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably not a, I mean, you can, but it's just going to be a very awkward conversation yeah. for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And they won't back you up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm like, you are not the asshole director. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's, I mean, I, I feel like a lot of people, um, that would be their dream, right? Is to, to kind of work with, with the person that they, they love the most and kind of create this tangible thing that they can now forever show the world. And they can even just for themselves, they have this thing that they're so proud of that they invested so much of themselves in. Um, I think that that concept of boundaries is really, really crucial for anybody, anybody out there like looking for this kind of symbiotic partnership and really having those clear terms of like, when we're at home, we are at home. And of course, your mind is going to be racing about logistics and the creative decisions you made that day on set and whether or not you, you got the scene or you feel good about it. But it's just having those, um, like if, if you're working five day shoot weeks, two days off for the weekend, take those weekends to do laundry, to do grocery shopping and to forget about the film for half of a second, just to recharge, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's totally true. And and really realize that you're going to want to break those boundaries when things aren't easy. When things are good, you're going to be fine not talking about it. But when things are hard, you're obviously going to want to say, yeah, but we, yeah, but this thing happened on set and we have to talk about it. But like, I, I think, I think thinking of boundaries as a couple in that creative space as something that is necessary and that you won't, it's like, it's like being a, um, it's like trying to quit smoking. Like you're, you're not always going to want a cigarette, but when it's cold outside or when it's cold outside and you're depressed and there's a bunch of people that you like standing out back shivering, that's when you want it. And so it's like, um, just, just realizing the value in that and like, just that's a part of the process. And, and again, co compounding that with playback, I think is really valuable, especially if it's that situation. And for those who uh, aren't aware what playback is, it is when you're on set and you guys go for a take um, and you're at the monitors, you're able to play back the scene and watch it, um, what you just filmed in real time. So that way directors you utilize that a lot of times to see you know, if they're focusing on one aspect of the scene or the shot. Um, now a larger team around it can kind of take eyes on it and just kind of get reassurance what they got is what they got. Right. Um, I got a couple other fan questions here. Um, from Nick Aquilino, uh, what was the process of doing post-production? Do you need a separate fundraising? Also, what was the Skywalker connection about? I'm not sure about the Skywalker connection. Oh, yeah. Skywalker is yeah. the sound uh, that we used. Yeah, oh. we did our sound at Skywalker um, Ranch with... Okay. Oh, Tom that's super cool. What? That's yeah. awesome. With Tom Myers and Zach Martin. Mm -hmm. And um, whose name sounds like a pop star to me, Zach Martin. Zach Martin. Um, total, total pop star in a different life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that connection was just that we we were lucky enough that they liked the film in a rough state and were willing to work with us on the sound. Um, and through a series of like minor hoops, we're able to make the budget work for us too. So, um, so did you save your, did, in, in planning out your budget, you didn't spend all of it in, in prep and pre-production. You set you allotted money for post-production. Yeah, yeah. Because I have been in situations where like, for instance, there's a film that I'm really hoping will be premiering soon online um, that I produced for a friend six years ago that hasn't come out because there was no money allocated for post. Um, it was one of those things where we'd seen a lot of friends who were really savvy with grants who just somehow would, it was always like, oh, and we'll get a post grant for that. We're get, we'll get a post grant for that. I have yet to have a post grant. <laughs> so it's been eight years of doing this. Don't count on a post grant. But um, yeah, we had money put aside for post. We had money budgeted for post in the budget, but uh, we ended up doing a additional raise amongst the investors 
so that we could do Skywalker. Uh, and and that's felt, after you showed them kind of a cut of what you had, like a rough cut of what you've already shot and then just say, hey, to push us across the finish line, we need a little bit more or what was that? Yeah, I mean, we didn't even have to show them a rough cut. We just said, we need this because it's going to make the film exponentially better. Um, a lot of times I feel like if your film is already unreal in a way, if it's, you know, science fiction and it's nobody's ever heard a spaceship fly by your ear then maybe you don't need to go spend, you know, a, a large chunk of your budget on sound. But if your film is like all about grounding people in this world mm -hmm. and you were rushing in production and you had cicadas and overlapping lines, then maybe you should, maybe you should like, like how, how great would it be if you got to spend like two straight weeks on sound? Um, that's actually, that's all like an awesome piece of advice because I can't tell you how many times I've been on set and like, you gotta hold for a plane and then the plane passes and then there's a train and then the train passes and there's a kid in a bike and like you just at a certain point you have to make your day right so you have to just shoot through the pain and like hopefully you'll figure it out so maybe that's a you know great to have that a little extra cash specifically for something like sound yeah yeah 100%. it made the movie watchable it was it not watchable <laughs> when, which yeah. is so surprising because it's such a it's such a fun like it, it's such a grounded earnest film in and of itself that you don't necessarily think that there's so much um, on the post side of things that are making this seem small and authentic and perfect and in the minutia of it all. Yeah. There's a huge, it's, it's unbelievable how much is, uh, is artificial in the film. It's, it's so also, subtle. Good. The dialogue is really important. It's sort of a dialogue based film. And there was so much of the dialogue that it was like hard to hear. And so they were able to go in and do magic, but there's lots of like smoke and mirrors that they taught us about at Skywalker. That was like, does a moment feel dead here? Add a lawnmower outside. Like it'll give weird life in a way that the viewer won't know why it feels alive. Yeah. But it'll just register as being real. Yeah. While at the same time, I bet your AD is like, we can't use this take. There's a lawnmower outside. And yeah. it's like, no, you can't, like you can, there would be lawn, maybe not for the continuity of editing. You want to keep that clean, but like, you absolutely, there would be a lawnmower in real life in this scene. Well, well, actually, in, in the example Kelly gave, the so what they do in post is, it, it, and this is a good indicator of whether you're working with a good sound designer or a good sound supervisor, is the dialogue is completely isolated. So you basically have only words, no background, and then you build back up the background. So what we would do is something we called like shaking keys where if there was a scene that felt in our inauthentic or dead or a cut that felt weird, we would add a pre-recorded garbage truck backing up or a lawnmower effect mm -hmm. or a plane flying overhead to sort of mask that moment of um, garbage trucks backing up in this film. <laughs> <laughs> Chicago's um, full of garbage trucks apparently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was yeah. cool because it built in the difference of, you know, Bridget lives in Chicago. So when she's in her apartment or in her boyfriend's apartment, you hear the train, you hear traffic. And then when you go to the Northern suburbs, you hear like cicadas and you hear- um, Oh yeah, that's- And all these subliminal things that sort of guide us on an instinctual level to sounds that we know in life and that we can be like, oh right, peace versus chaos of the city. Yeah. That's great. That's really subtle filmmaking. Um, that's awesome. I, I got another one here from Peter Hitchcock regarding distribution again. He plans on selling uh, his feature um, to streaming services. Do you guys have any, um, do you guys have any experiences with Seed and Spark or selling to Vimeo, Amazon Prime? He really wants to focus on this indie market. Got it. Um, no experience with those. What, what I do know is that, um, well, I shouldn't say no experience. I think what I've found in peers of, of mine that have gone that route is, you know, you're not, they're not especially going to be spending on marketing. So like Oscilloscope had a marketing cap for us that encompassed social media, it encompassed um, press agents. And so once they reached that cap, it was like, all right, we reached the cap. But it was awesome that they were willing to spend that much. And so what I would say for any, if you're selling your film straight to Vimeo or putting it up on Amazon, not selling to Amazon as like, um, as, as the distributor, so to speak, I would say just like make sure that you yourself have a, a big budget for, or a comparatively big budget for marketing. 
So for social media pushes, um, for targeted ads, um, just look at what they're doing at Vanishing Angle, uh, Jim Cummings and uh, Ben. Oh, Weiss. with uh, Thunder Road? Yeah, with Thunder Road, all their shorts. They found these incredible partners and they've really, really, the, the analytics side of things, like they have been, they've really specifically targeted, like what can we do? Let's make a trailer that is specifically targeted to 24 year old women. And now let's make a trailer that's targeted to 24 year old men. And now let's make a trailer and then just shoot it straight to those markets. Um, so like, that's a really good example of thinking of your audience prior to the film, prior to whatever you're, you're shooting, right? You're, you're making this, and that's what a lot of commercial directors are a lot of the time too, is like, it's, you're working away from the narrative scope of things where you're going, it's not inauthentic, but you're not speaking from the heart, you're speaking for the masses. And you are now a, um, you're the vocal point for people to, to hear your message and you're, you're guiding your message specifically towards a group of people. I think that's definitely true in the marketing stage of things, like the trailer and the poster, I think there's like um there's like a spectrum of your poster and your trailer should be almost like aspirational. Mm -hmm. Think of what the best version of the film is, even if it's not quite what it is. Like I think our poster, I love it because it elevates the film in a way. It's like a very scrappy handheld film, and yet the poster is a stained glass window with like an ultra realistic painting in it. Um, so like thinking about that, like your trailer is a story. It'll get people to click something. Um, and so even if you make your film unapologetic, like Thunder Road is pretty unapologetic and, and quite, quite odd, but it has been really successful with a lot of different demographics. Yeah, uh, definitely recommend checking it out. Really fun film. Um, how do you guys, how do making films, how do you see that impacting the world around you? How do you see being a filmmaker as, as kind of like your voice to kind of make a mark on this society? Well, coming from theater, it's wild that St. Francis has been now seen by more people who have cumulatively in the past 15 years of my career ever seen me in a play. And so it's really weird just to be like, the reach of filmmaking is so great. And especially that, you know, people can stream our film online. You know, it's reaching people in different countries and in my hometown and it's, it's a chance for me to talk about things that I feel passionately about. You know, I do feel passionately about female rights and, and to put it in a narrative where people aren't feeling like they're being hit over the head, but hopefully they're empathizing with the characters. And I feel like that's something I've always been passionate about in theater, but now all of a sudden I'm realizing that filmmaking just gives you access to the whole world. And that feels kind of remarkable to me. Yeah. I, and I, I think on the other end of things, it's an industry. Like you, even in the independent world, you are, the people that you hire and the people that you cast are going to move on to more industrious, more commercial spaces. So who you hire and who you cast and representation yeah. is incredibly important, especially on the ground level. You know, you may think like, oh, well, all my friends are white men. And so that's the only people I can cast and or hire. Use a service like Mandy to like look outside the mirror and find, find those collaborators um, because um, I don't know, I think that, I think independent filmmakers have actually a lot more voice in the sort of struggle for equity and representation than they think. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think it is about your film specifically that's resonated the most with people? I think the honesty in talking about topics that have been considered taboo or have been stigmatized. And I think the genuine heart in the movie is the thing that people again and again talk about. Um, that it is a film that has an abortion in it. It has postpartum depression. And yet people have said again and again that they walk away not having felt like, okay, I've taken my medicine. I've like really thought about some issues um, that it makes them feel close to the characters. And I've had so many people say, yeah, I've gone through something like that. And it really matters that it's on screen. Again, representation, like stories that people have been shamed for in the past, being presented in an unapologetic yet complicated way, not having to just be like, I only feel this one shade of this color about this thing, but it's like a vast spectrum of humanity that's explored in the film. 
yeah. No, I think it's a fantastic answer. Um, I got another one. When pressed for time on set and you need to make a split second decision, do you trust your gut or do you trust the team around you that you've built? Hmm. I, I, um, on day one, you trust the team. But by the end of the week, I think it's kind of in, at least for me, it's very in me. And so it becomes instinctual. It's like, what lens am I shooting on? Am I handheld? What direction am I shooting? Whose scene is this? What's the story we're trying to tell? Those questions, I think, start to become ingrained around that time. Um, so I think a lot of that comes too with the preparedness of of knowing what you're what you're making, walking into set that day, you know. Yeah, yeah. I think that trusting your team is awesome, and but I also think that like they're also there to trust you. So mm -hmm. having like a limited number of people that you turn to and say, "We got it right," is is great. Um, the the mentality of like, "Okay, let's get playback. Everybody watch this take. What do we think, guys?" That's um, a less constructive version. Sure. There's just not enough time in the day to do that. And also at the end of the day, like you need one person calling the shots. You need, it all kind of comes to the director to have that, that decisiveness, you know? Yeah. I also think you'll know in your gut, like we argued over some scenes that should or shouldn't be cut. And there was one scene that the entire team was like, cut that scene. And I was like, I hear you. No, I'm not. Yeah. Going. And it ended up being like a really important scene in the movie. And then there were other scenes that the entire team was like, cut that scene. And I was sort of like, yeah, but I don't know, I kind of like it. And they were right, and that scene did get cut. And so I think it's a combination of, there are gonna be some things that the entire team is right about, and then there are gonna be other things that you're gonna be like, in your soul, you're gonna know, I just have a feeling about this thing. And that's the time to trust your, your gut, I think. There, yeah. there, were, there were a series of scenes that we shot one day, one long day, and, after take one, Nate, the DP and I came together and Kelly was in the scene and I was like, this isn't gonna, this isn't working. Let's just get through this as fast as possible. And it was, it were, it, they were these scenes that didn't end up in the movie. Um, but it was really interesting just to like know that and to feel like, oh, we need to move on to have a sense of time. Mm -hmm. uh, you end up relying on more people than you think just in like different, different ways, different zones. Sure, and I think that's also, uh, it's, it's important to know that like, the film will go on without that. Not everything is, that, there are absolutely vital moments, but like, maybe that's in, in writing too, like, I'm not saying necessarily make right, like fluff scenes in between, just in case you don't get it on the day, but like, there will, there's always a creative solution towards uh, uh, logistics that you might run into on, on set. Totally. Um, <laughs> oh, sorry, what was that? Reshoots. Reshoots, very real. Times. It's okay. And especially with reshoots too, everybody has in their in their bones kind of like what you're doing. It's not long, it's no longer a brand new team. Like these are seasoned pros coming back for season two almost. Um, yeah. yeah. Slightly right. smaller scale. One very quick piece of advice I would say that really helped us. When you finish shooting a day and you realize you're gonna have to reshoot something, try to build it into your existing schedule rather than pushing it to pickups. Because your pickups are going to end up being a bunch of inserts and maybe something that hasn't even been written yet. Um, so try to build it. We built most of our reshoots into our schedule. So that's really great. Yeah, you have lighter days and you have, you know, two, two or three actors working that day and it's going to be logistically pretty easy. That's probably the best time to complicate things a little bit more with things you might have to redo. Right, right. Yeah. Um, Mike Lindy wants to know how prepared were you in terms of attending festivals that you presented your films in? Like, what did you have to know um, about your project and maybe about the festivals that you're attending, people running the festivals, assets you might have brought, EPKs? I was really worried about all that. Um, but the way that I remember responding to being anxious about it was I said, we're nobody, nobody knows us and nobody cares. And so I'm not gonna print a single flyer a single business card, a single poster. We're not going to do anything, anything. And um, and we won the audience award. So it was like it, it, I, I, it was like this little test where I was like, I am too, I'm too anxious about this. Instead of doing any of that stuff, 
Kelly and I are just gonna try to go see every other movie in our category and say hi and shake hands and say awesome job to those filmmakers and just try to see movies. Um, so even though was South by was like your crowning, like a, that, that's your reach festival, you got there, you didn't promote it at all while you were there. Not at all. No, we didn't. I also um, feel like it's important for us to say, we did apply to all those fancy festivals and we didn't get in. Yeah. Like, even though we're saying that like we were gunning for South by the whole time and that is where we wanted to go. I think it's important for people to hear that we got rejected from yeah, yeah. many, many sure. festivals. We, we still, we got accepted into a festival over a year later that had rejected us the previous <laughs> Oh, year. for the following year? Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah. I won't say which one, but we're, it's coming up. Um, <laughs> we, okay. We, I think we sort of were like, our goal here is to promote this film through, like, like our goal is not to promote the film, but to promote community and try, try to find this community. And, um, and having said that though, like Alex did email the programmers at South by Southwest every step of the way of us, like, we're gonna go do sound at Skywalker. Like, it's not like we submitted and then just sat back. back. Yeah. We tried to remain engaged, but then once we were in the festival, we were like, okay, let's see what happens. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty cool. Now I know we're running pretty short on time here. We're about to be done, but I, I wanna, you know, if you guys have any advice for, um, people who are making films that are just struggling to get seen, to build an audience for them. Do you guys have any, any advice for those folks? Man, building an audience. I mean, I would just say, make sure that you're telling a story that you feel personally really connected to, because I think if it's a specific story that feels real, then there's a chance that an audience will grow. I feel like, again, sometimes people start with the goal of like, I wanna get an audience, what should I write? And I think if you start from a specific place that feels true to you, it will be easier to get that audience. Yeah, yeah, like if you wanna make a, if you wanna make a short that's gonna end up being a feature, but you don't quite have the money to make the short that you want, and so you end up making a teaser, like you can make a, a, a tone trailer for a project with found footage. You don't need to go spend 20 grand. But if you have like a little movie that feels like it's just begging to come out, I think the advice I'd give is just don't wait for anyone to give you permission. Um, find the way you can make it and keep like we're, I'm in the process right now of trying to consider whether to make um, a horror film this fall in COVID specific conditions. And I'm, I have had this existential thing where I'm like, well, who's going to watch? How's this going to, like, there's no festival to aim for. There's, is there a distributor to like hope for? Like, I, I don't even know how people would watch this um, if I made it uh, as best as it could possibly be. And so it really ends up having to be like, is this a story you want to tell with people you want to tell it with, with masks on? Um, but then at what point of that do you tell it for your identity as a filmmaker for you? This is something that I, you know, a lot of times I, I have to make this thing and like, I don't care if anybody sees this. I want, I want to tell this story. Well, a lot of times I think that's the, that's the fun of trying to convince people to finance something is you have to, you realize by the time you either get or don't get the money, whether you mean what you're saying. Cause you can't go approach investors and be like, yeah, I feel okay about this thing. I think it's gonna be interesting. It's gonna be a, I don't know, it'll be cool. You have to be like, this is it. This is it. It's doing things differently. It's taking chances, it's taking risks. Um, I believe in it, I love it. I love the story, this is where it comes from. And then when they come back at you and they're like, I don't understand the dream sequences. You either have to be like, yeah, me neither. Or no, they're genius, this is why. You're right. Everybody's going to love this. You don't understand this, but this is part. <laughs> yeah. And that's a real example. I don't know if I understand the dream sequences. You, you all will know in within a year if, if they get made. <laughs> okay. Right. Well, you know, if you are going to make that film in the fall, we do recommend you use Mandy.com to find all your cast and your crew. Uh, mm -hmm. We are running short on time here. Alex Thompson, Kelly Sullivan, thank you guys so much for joining us today. Um, if anybody's going to see your film, what's a great place for them to, to watch it at? Watching on Amazon is great for us. Um, Amazon or Google, Google iTunes. I, iTunes, any of those have like 
great direct link to us and you know give us a little rating or whatever mm -hmm. um everything helps so it's true saint francis film that's it thank you guys so much for joining us today if you guys have any other questions feel free to email us or uh write posts on our facebook page follow the filmmakers we will see you next time thank you so much thank you